Well, we'll get started. Um, hopefully the uh, video will work this week. Those of you who uh, watch online, I apologize for last week, the glitch we had. Well, last week we spent um, all of our time, except for the brief review, looking at the phrase here in Hebrews 9, I turned away from them, says the Lord. I thought, because Israel had been in the news a lot recently, and is still, and uh, that one hears a lot of religious leaders and even politicians stating that we must support God's chosen people in order to avoid being cursed by God. I thought because of this misunderstanding of Scripture that it would probably serve us well and be appropriate for us to look at um, how this biblical, how this position is biblically inaccurate. Uh, it's interesting because I heard our Representative Burleson quote, uh, well, it, it wasn't an exact quote, it was a paraphrase about God's promise to Abraham in an interview that he was having this past week on the radio, and I thought of our lesson. Well, the scriptures that we looked at were Genesis 12, where God made his promise to Abraham, and that was the passage that Burleson was uh, quoting or referring to. And that's where God makes his promise to Abram at that point, had it been ter termed Abraham. And we looked at uh, Deuteronomy 7, uh, verses 7 through 11, as well as 2 Samuel 7, 22 through 24. And by the way, if, if any of you are interested, I... I can print out this whole thing that we did last week for you if you, if you want it. Um, all those scriptures and others, but all those are the ones that we looked at, were, are used as a scriptural basis by those who make this claim that the modern day nation of Israel is still under special protection by God. Um, and they also use oftentimes Romans 11... 28, taking it out of context because you can't use that verse in the way they're using it without looking at the context in which it is appearing both above and below uh, verse 28 says this is not a special relationship anymore. So in providing biblical proof of the falseness of this position of support for modern day Israel, we read Together, um, I alluded to some prophecies in uh, Isaiah 41, Isaiah 42, um, and we, we read a number of others. Uh, Christ, you recall, when he stood up in the temple, read, I think it was Isaiah 61, the first few verses. Um, and we read specifically Isaiah 54, 7 through 15. If you recall in that passage, it talks about the walls of Jerusalem being rebuilt and having precious stones in the walls. So that's not happened and it's not going to happen, I don't think, in modern day Israel. Uh, and other passages in Isaiah which obviously refer not to a physical Israel, but to the coming of Christ and his kingdom. We read from Romans 9 verses 2 through 16 and 21 through 26. We read Romans 10, verse 4, and then 19 through 20, and Romans 11, 1 through 15, and 28 through 32, and then from Ephesians chapter 2, all of which explain that modern Israel and modern Jerusalem refer to a kingdom, to use Christ's words when he talked about calling um, on angels. They refer to a kingdom not of this world. Not of this world. Any uh, comments on that before we move along? Hopefully that gives you a better foundation of uh, 
scriptural foundation as to uh, the falseness of the idea of uh, physical Israel being God's people. I mean, we knew that. I think everyone, I don't think anyone in here would have argued differently, but having a scriptural basis is, is the best support. And so if we support Israel in any way, it should be for reasons other than, well, it's biblical. And in this context now, Hebrews 8.10, the next verse that we're going to read becomes clearer. Um, Doug, do you have uh, Hebrews chapter 8? Why don't you read uh, through uh, 10 through 13, please. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Okay. Um. Billy, can you look up Isaiah 54, okay. 13? This language here, um, I guess it's not highlighted in the overhead. I will put my teachings in their minds and write them on their hearts. Of course, is all this is a quotation from uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, uh, verses uh, Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. But it's very similar language to what Isaiah uses in chapter 54, 13. How does that read in your translation, Bill? Okay. All your sons will be taught by the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. Okay. The New Century says all your children will be taught by the Lord. Okay. Um, and so again, when we read in 54, that was a... Prophecy of the coming Israel, spiritual Israel. This is the conflict that we have here in Hebrews. The physical versus the spiritual. And the physical, I want to hold on to because routine and circumstance and um, these things make me feel like I'm in a worshipful state and I don't want to give them up. And, and if I can do all these things, I can check these boxes. That's actually easier for me than having this kind of nebulous, well, grace and love and all this out here and freedom in Christ Jesus. And uh, plus... If I'm a Jew, I'm no longer special because I'm a Jew. I'm special in God's eyes if I'm a Jew who believes, if I'm a Jew who is uh, in Christ. So this, this language, I'll put my teachings in their minds and hearts. It's in Jeremiah, of course, quoted here in Hebrews. It's in Isaiah 54. And um, this verse 11, people will no longer have to teach their neighbors and relatives to know the Lord. Does that mean God doesn't need evangelists anymore? No. I see heads going back and forth. What does it mean? Well, to the Jew, a neighbor is someone in the nation of Israel, right? To the Jew, a relative is a fellow Jew to whom I'm related. So we're talking about, by definition, uh, God's people here, right? Does that ring with you? Okay. So if we assume that this passage is talking about God's people, believers, well then are we wasting our time studying together? No. 
I mean, this says God's going to speak to each of us. God's going to, uh, we won't have to teach our neighbors and relatives, our neighbors and relatives. It would seem that this prophetic quote, again, we're struggling with the physical versus the spiritual. This is talking about the Holy Spirit, in my opinion. This is a prophecy that God is going to dwell in us. As Paul says, you are the temple of the living God. Well, if God's dwelling in you, you, you just listen to that spirit that is in you. Um, and Paul says that spirit will teach you and will guide you. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I don't see how this can mean anything else because if we take it to the physical realm, hmm, well, we still, why did Paul go to Asia and Minor and go on the missionary journey. What, what was that all about? Well, it was about teaching people about the Lord and not, not anything to do with this Hebrews 8, 11. And I believe this is the same um, thing that, Donnie, if you want to turn over to Romans 8, please. I believe this is the same idea that Paul is talking about in Romans. Um, we'll read Romans 8. Five through fourteen. So this, remember, this is God teaching us is, is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Go ahead. Those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. Those who are fourteen. No. So then, brethren, okay. we are under obligation not to flesh, but to live according to. The Let me start again. Verse 12. So then, brethren, we are not Israel. Right? So again, as I mentioned earlier, this conflict between the physical and the spiritual, physical and spiritual, and which will from the least to the most important. It's not saying we don't learn by studying together. It's not saying that we aren't supposed to evangelize or teach non-believers people who don't know the Lord, to know the Lord and come to Him, it's not saying that. Okay. It's already said in their hearts, for one thing, they've already, they've already uh, been informed as to what it says. Right. Uh, so that teaching really is not, I mean, there's always good things in repetition, but uh, it won't be necessary. Right. So well, in Acts 2.38, too, the Holy Spirit, and so on. Yeah. Okay, back to Hebrews chapter 8. He said, anything that's old and worn out is ready to disappear. 13, um, go ahead and start there again if you would, please. 13? Yes, 8.13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Okay. If we look over in Hebrews 9, again, the writer here is wanting to make clear to these people, this old system is not supplementing. It's not coming alongside of. It's not the mosaical plus. It is replacing. This time of year in Monette, um, and I don't know the exact date. I'd, I'd have to look online. The city goes around and picks up stuff. So if you've got an old mattress that you want to get rid of or some old furniture or an old oven or, I mean, an old washing machine. You can set it out at the curb, and this is one of the only places I've ever lived that does this, and it's great. They will pick it up and take it away for you. Uh, I 
down at the end of uh, the street that runs along the west side of the hospital before you turn on the county road or whatever it is there and go on south as you're going south from where I live uh, from Cleveland. Somebody had, I mean, they, they had stuff stacked across the curb there as wide as our whole door system there. Uh, I mean, it was bags and stuff and all kinds of stuff in, in anticipation of this coming event. And so anything that's old and worn out is ready to get rid of, ready to haul off to the trash, ready to disappear. And then in Hebrews 9, he's launching into a description of this inferior system uh, to show exactly why it is inferior. This is why we're getting rid of it. Yes, you're familiar with this, but we're going to describe it, and then I'll show you why it's inferior. Uh, even though it did have glory in its own right, didn't it? Yes, it's, it's somewhat easy on our side of this to see what's going on, but if, if everything you have ever known about the traditional way you worship, the laws that you follow, that is, that is it's more than what you do, it's who you are. Right. And Paul's saying that, or whoever the writer is, yes. he's saying that's coming to an end. This new agreement is going to replace it. So all these things that you were doing that you felt brought you closer to God, they're going to fade away. And this new, through Christ, is the way we're, is, is what God has established. That, that would be very hard to, if that was where your being was focused, that would be hard to let go of. I mean, there's a reason that so much verbiage is put together for that purpose here. Again, it's this tension between the physical and the spiritual. Remember the awe that the apostles had regarding the temple. I mean, they could read in the Old Testament about how God's presence was there in a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. That's not glorious? Oh yeah, that's glorious. But this is even more. And trying to imagine worshiping God without the physical surroundings of that glorious temple. I mean, that was why it was so important to go back to the homeland and rebuild the temple, Zerubbabel. And you know, we see the Holy Spirit. So you, one of the biggest things Christ got in trouble for with the Jews is because he said he was the son of God. So he was, he was claiming deity. I don't know this, and I would have to research. I bet it was hard for a Jew to fathom that God would live within them. Mm -hmm. But then now the writers are saying, no, the Holy Spirit. And, and Christ, told, Christ told them why, but they didn't honor what he said. But this is why it's better. This is, I'm gonna, and this thing that you just talked about, but for them to, they wouldn't even utter the name, yet now God's going to dwell in me. That. That is, I think that is, that would be a huge obstacle to get over for them initially. Right. There were all these boundaries between the worshiper and God. Now, the high priest was in there, but even he had a lot of boundaries. And he even started getting elevated because of these. Yes. Which was not the, not the intent ever, but he did. Right. And I can't approach God because if I do, well, I can read in the Old Testament about people that tried to get too close to God. And so the writer of Hebrews talks about all this, and we're going to read it, about all this separation and how that no longer exists. So you can go right up. You can have a relationship with God. You can interact with God personally. He's going to live in you and me. Wow. Again, hard to conceive if we've had all this indoctrination and instruction, uh, things drilled into us. You be careful. You don't even say that word. Words are free. Yeah. Uh, he's the only one. I can see where they would be flabbergasted. 
a also the flesh being so evil that he dwell in this flesh, this evil flesh. Well, how can I how can I get rid of my sin if I can't take a lamb or a dove or something and sacrifice it that quick? I mean, that was so much a part of their lives. Um, you have a firstborn son you take him to the temple and have him circumcised and you offer an offering. It, it was just just so much. So I mean, a, just, just go away. right. And that's that's the thing we see a lot of times in especially the old uh, Christianity religions, going back to the Roman religion. I mean, there's all this pomp and circumstance and ceremony and dressing a certain way, and you have a priest. And it's the weak analogy would be taking a Catholic away from all that and who do, who do I go to to confess my sins? To get absolved? Uh, you know, and that, that was, and it's still difficult for them to, uh, I don't know really what, to grasp that uh, I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. There's some comfort. There's a physical comfort in having some traffic. This is where I go to worship God. This is where God is. This is God's house. Nope. Nope. Because if I'm God's house, ooh, that's scary. Where am I taking God? You, know, you say don't do this, but I say if you start thinking on these things and start saying different. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a big. It's it's bigger. It's a bigger switch that I think than we realize for the people hearing a lot of these things at the time because we we've had many years past to understand this teaching. Right. But even we. Oh yeah. I mean, we like to depart, we like to depart, coming like to coming here is still a comfort to us. Not necessarily because we interact with the... Hopefully it is. But for some people that don't interact that much, it's just the place. A safe place. What's that? A safe place. Yes. Yeah. That's why we're going to church. Right. Going to church. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And just you know, just think of that. Uh, you're moving someone out out of what they've known. It's it's kind of like trappings of civilization. Uh, I take my wife home. First thing she does is kick her shoes off. Uh, she's trying to get away from the trappings of civilization. So she's got them on now, and it hurts more when she kicks you. <laughs>
ingrained in them for generation after generation after thousands of years. This, this law has been in place for these people. It was very difficult for them to say, okay, Jesus is the Messiah, we will follow him, and the temple is nothing. Now that was, that was hard. Mm. It was very hard. It goes against the human grain to, to make that drastic change. And we read about that all through the New Testament where the writers are encouraging the Judaizers to quit, quit pushing this, this thought of uh, you have to be a Jew and follow all these traditions to be saved. Um, and it goes on for probably I guess even till today. So this is uh, this this was very difficult for those first Christians that well, came from Judaism. And no matter what your station in life, even if you were the proverbial toilet cleaner of society, when you walked into the temple, you were special because there were some people who couldn't get in. This was an exclusive craft that you are now among. So even though in Jewish society you might be looked down on, once you got there, you had other people that you could look down on. That wasn't there anymore. And so, in Hebrews 9, he launches into this description. Uh, beginning in verse 1, please, and we'll read down through... We'll read through 15. Go ahead. 9, 1 through 15. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship but also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its conse consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place which, which had the golden altar of incense and the candy covered Ark of the Covenant. The Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were cherubim of the, of the glory, overshadowing atone, the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. That everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, uh, for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Okay, now here, here the writer is going to insert an aside about how the Spirit instructs God's people about God and how worship of Him has changed. He's, he's talking about how the holy, the. The high priest has gone into this holy of holies, the most holy place. And you can't deny, even from this description, that there is a great deal of glory. I mean, you've got this gold-covered box. This is where God, the, the, as your translation said, this is where the glory was. And then he inserts this little instruction here about the change in this. Go ahead. Verse 8. The Holy Spirit was, was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle uh, was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are now uh, already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but <laughs> entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the, and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled 
on those who are ceremonial and unclean, sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How, how much more, more then will the blood of the Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, to cleanse our consciousness, this is from Acts, that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, okay, Christ... Okay, hold, hold up right there. Okay. Um, so, one of the reasons that the writer here is going through this, again, is to show, as verse 9 says, that these things couldn't make the conscience righteous or perfect or complete clear we couldn't appear righteous before God but Christ then here in uh, 11 he was able to go in but he didn't go into this physical tent he went into a place that is much superior it's a spiritual so we're getting rid of this physical he entered the spiritual place not made with hands and the sacrifice that he took wasn't this imperfect sacrifice that didn't take away the, the guilt um, it cleansed the body the blood that was sprinkled cleansed the body it cleansed items remember when um, they were purifying the tabernacle to get ready he sprinkled but that was to purify those things but verse 14 how much more is done by the blood of Christ because his blood is going to make our consciences pure where does God live inside what does the spirit guide through our conscience through our mind we read that in Romans. So by doing this process, we are able to go where the high priest went in, in the presence of God. We are able to serve the living God. And in Romans, he talks about being a living sacrifice. Go ahead in 15, please. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, not that he has died as a ransom to set them, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from sins committed under the first covenant. Okay. Okay, so the writer is covering those who are called now, those who are called by God can now, and those who lived under the first agreement the people who lived under the first agreement as all being covered by this final sacrifice, this perfect sacrifice. Go ahead. It's interesting. You, you, you look at to me as I sit here listening to this. So you have these people who have followed God to his instructions in a, in a way that at the time was pleasing to God and now but God had a plan from the beginning he, he knew he knew this was going to happen but now they're saying okay all this stuff you've done before even though it was sufficient at the time mm -hmm. is no longer sufficient because there's something better God that's say God because they, they they really what Paul talks about it whether you know how would I have known Really, how would I have known what was right and wrong and how to please God if it hadn't been for this old way of doing things? What when God laid out this law? Right. Yet now, all this thing that throughout your history has brought you blessings from God and God is allowed is allowed God to be in your presence is now fading away, and there's this new that's better that allows God to dwell in you. That that you know. That sounds simple enough when you read this, but I'm glad I did not live this. Oh, yeah. Well, as Donnie was talking about, this change, you know, if, if you had, let's say you were 40 years old, and all of your life you had gone up to the temple 
and these sacrifices you had accepted as that was making you right with God. And now this, this teaching is saying, no, you, you really weren't right with God. What? I mean, that is a slap in the head. I mean, that's just a way. I mean, that, that yeah. hits you hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You remember the big shortcoming of the Old Testament law was that it could not set people free from their sins. It could not make them righteous so they could enter into that holy of place and be next to God. And nobody could perfectly keep it until Christ came and he fulfilled it. Go ahead. Yeah, God we still do. That. God did that. But it wasn't in their heart. If God is in our heart, his laws, and then he, if something's in your heart, it's a part of you. Right. And if it had been a part of them, they would not have forsaken him regularly. That's coming up. But they just, they were capable. Otherwise, I mean, everything that happened, they just, they, they would turn around and throw But they needed all this shiny, glorious rituals and symbols, and they just weren't there yet. Right. You know, she said that, and they weren't capable. But the thing is, we're, we're still not capable. <laughs> it's grace. God's grace and the sacrifice of Christ that made it possible because we're still not capable. Have you ever, there, and I don't mean in any way, any stretch, to minimize the importance of what we do. Is there anything more human than eating and drinking? More physical? There's not. It's required for us that's right. And I think, and again, there's no scripture to back this, so don't, this is just me, okay? I think God made this one concession to our human side and said, look, I know that eating and drinking is something that you do that's very human. And so I'm going to help you switch over to the spiritual side by giving you this physical thing to remember me by. You can take in this food and this drink and it's going to be a physical thing, but I want you to be spiritually doing something when you're doing this. And uh, again, no, no scripture to back that. Could he have done it differently? I'm sure it could. It's God. He could have done it in many different ways. But in my thought, he, there's this concession made to our physical side so that we can physically be doing something to help us leap over to the spiritual and understand that it was all about Christ. Well, why did he put all these ceremonies in place for them to remember? Yeah. Because he knew who he knew. He knew his people. Right. Yeah. We'll uh, stop there, and I appreciate your comments and your thoughts, and we'll pick up there next time. I guess this spontaneously resurrected. Yep. Covered until